This is episode 71 with Mike Gula. Welcome to Spot On Insurance. Join us each week as we speak to insurance professionals, attorneys, regulators, and compliance specialists on topics ranging from improving your agency to staying on the right side of the law. Subscribe and stay informed on the effects of new trends and disruptive emerging technologies on your businesses and your industry. Hi, I'm Ted Tavares. And I'm Arlene Tavares. Our guest today, Mike Gula, has been an underwriter for some major players, including Nationwide, Insurance, and Allstate Company, and now he is Director of Underwriting for Hippo. Earlier this year, he spoke at the Insurance AI and Analytics USA Summit regarding using artificial intelligence and predictive learning for underwriting. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you on Spot on Insurance. Welcome. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to be here. So, Mike, you were at Nationwide for several years before you joined Insurance. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about what set you on your path to an insurance career? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I moved to from New York to Atlanta in 2004 uh, and actually took a position with Enterprise Rent-A-Car straight out of college. Okay. Many people do, which is a great, uh, a great launching experience, which I, uh, I worked in the rental business for a few months before I made the transition over into their insurance department. And I worked as an on-site, on-site account representative with Nationwide and Allstate of all companies uh, and managed most of their southeastern regional uh, rental business for the insurance carriers for total loss and in that space for about three and a half years. And then I got recruited by Nationwide to join their total loss claims team, who I had been working with while I was at uh, at Enterprise. So I spent about six months in the claims team and then Nationwide decided to shut down uh, their vehicle valuation centers in the regions and relocate them to Ohio, which I was not willing to move back to a, to a snow state. So I actually made the shift over to the underwriting team as they were relocating Nationwide had done kind of a relocation of their underwriting teams to the various regional offices around the country, and one of those locations was Atlanta. And I was lucky enough to join their property underwriting team and work on auto, umbrella, high-value home, and uh, mainly in the property space with them for a number of years. Okay, so you actually um, joined the insurance industry right out of college. So when you were in college, you had no idea that you were going to be in the insurance industry, huh? I, I don't know that anybody ever knows that they want to be in the insurance industry. <laughs> you, you have some people, I guess, whose whose parents are agents and such, where they take over an agency. But uh, you know, I've crossed that five year mark, so I'm I'm a lifer at this point. Once it's got its claws in it, you're never getting out. Yeah, oh, I, I, I think that's what happened with us. We're 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 walking down the street, minding our own business, and we fall into insurance. Exactly. Exactly. No one. No one ever anticipates getting there, but insurance is one of those industries. When I was at Nationwide, it was right around the time that the crash happened in 2008. You know, I joined, you know, around that period of time. And, and, and insurance is interesting because it's a regulated market and homeowner space and auto space. It's a required product. So regardless of how the economy gets, there's always going to be a need for insurance, probably more so in an economic crisis and things. And that's where underwriting actually becomes even more important, which at the time was why you know, Nationwide was investing a lot of time and money into the underwriting programs and understanding of what was going on in the marketplace and such. So it's an interesting it's an interesting profession, but one that I, I actually care quite a bit about. But you know what's remarkable about it is that it touches just about every area of life. And yet very few people really know about it beyond home insurance, beyond, you know, a sales and agent. And, and we've mentioned that before in our podcast that I don't know what it is that people just don't realize that there are so many different types of jobs in the industry. And I don't know if it's a recruiting problem, but from the point where we joined insurance, we didn't know that all this stuff existed. Yep. It's so true. Yeah, I think some of that is going to change with um, all the new technology that we're seeing. So like the insurance industry is needing to get people that are engineers, that are uh, mechanics, that are well-versed in robotics. So it's becoming cool, which is very exciting. Yes. You know, Insurance is becoming super cool as an industry to work in. Exactly. Which, which prior to about 10 years ago, nobody said ever. Yes. So you went from nationwide to insurance, which is actually, like Ted mentioned earlier, it's an all-state company, which you work there for a little bit. But a lot of people would say that that's a transition, right? Because insurance, as part of their acquisition by Allstate, that Allstate was trying to get into the e-commerce space. And that was quite a while back. That was uh, probably like seven years ago. Yep. It was a pretty bold move back then, right? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's amazing because you fast forward to today, seven years later, and it, what was a bold move back then, if you're not doing that today, wouldn't you say that that's like doomsday for any company that's not doing it? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it was an interesting play, I think, at the time for, for Allstate to make the acquisition the way that they did, because not only did they get the insurance acquisition, they also got uh, AFI which was a large agency aggregator that also has a lot of connections into that space and the ability to purchase and broker business through multiple different carriers. So, you know, when I joined the company, I left Nationwide in 2013 to join Esurance's homeowners team. They didn't have a homeowners product. So Esurance was, you know, an auto direct writing auto company for, you know, basically their entire existence. They had a motorcycle program and a kind of quasi renters program that they had as well off of, uh, off the auto program that they had. So when I joined, there was no homeowners team. I was one of the first people on the homeowners underwriting team at that company. And we basically started off from scratch. A former colleague of mine that I had worked with at Nationwide and I, uh, when we both joined eSurance, it was really to build out a homeowners program and try and build a direct-to-consumer product in the kind of insurance model around a homeowners program that was similarly based off of the Allstate contract. And you know, obviously, they had lots of access to Allstate's information and everything else that we worked with. And we worked with some people from Allstate, but it was a unique transition because it was really the first, I guess, entry into that direct space in the homeowner space of how do you directly market a homeowner's product to a consumer online. It was an interesting shift, but I think it was definitely a bold move by Allstate being one of the first companies to kind of try and make that make that leap into this space. Share with us, how does a large organization like that make that shift from an underwriting perspective? So with the group that we had, it was... What was really nice was Allstate State was not very much involved in how we built out the homeowners program, while I, at least while I was at eSurance. So, you know, we had our own leadership team. I worked, I, I relocated from Atlanta to Sacramento and worked in the regional office for eSurance there. And eSurance's headquarters was in San Francisco, and I believe still is. And we really just got a, had an opportunity to have, you know, some all state insights and resources, but build the homeowners program from scratch. You know, the rate plan, the underwriting guidelines, the restrictions, the underwriting team. I was the first underwriter that was actually hired on that team. And when I left, you know, we were in excess of 20 people on the team and we're live in over 30 states. So it, it's hard, I think, with some of those larger carriers to pick up a company of that size. I mean, insurance was a pretty decent sized company at the time and let it run on its own. But we really did for a long time and had the opportunity to build out the program and the product and manage our own losses and claims and everything from that space. So we didn't have that much interaction from them really trying to control what we were doing. Obviously, we had access to some of the tools and some of the data, uh, but we worked hard on building our own policy management system and everything that managed the product that we had that was designed for our web interface that was direct to consumer. I mean, really, other than seeing an Allstate company underneath the insurance logo was really the only interaction and the really you know, big impact that there was at that time. Well, that was pretty bold because you're looking at trying something basically new and running through all the mistakes. And that's that's what happens when you're doing something completely different from everybody else. And, and people now, I think, nowadays are kind of scrambling to, they're talking about, hey, we've got to allow ourselves to make mistakes. We've got to allow ourselves to fall because we're trying new things. We can't say, hey, you, you can't fail at this. No, we need to probably fail faster so that we can learn more because most of us learn basically by failing. You learn what not to do sure. and then you get it right. So you guys were uh, kind of at the forefront of that. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's funny because in the insurance industry, and, and I, I'm not one to knock the insurance industry, but there are plenty of times that we don't learn from our mistakes. I mean, there's plenty of times that we do, but there's a lot of times that we don't. And, you know, the transition into the technology space and this direct-to-consumer atmosphere that you have now with consumers around cord cutting and separating from their cable company. People are more apt to operate in this space now around technology and be more comfortable where the traditional insurance experience was not was never set up that way. 20 years ago, I knew my dad's Allstate agent or State Farm agent by name at the time. That's just right. kind of how insurance was sold, where now people expect to be able to pull out their smartphone and say, hey, you know what? I want to order my groceries from the store. I don't even feel like getting off my couch anymore. So it's a different user experience and it's a different customer acquisition. But for some of these bigger incumbent carriers, they have so many products in so many ways. So it's, 
it's a much more slow moving beast and you have to kind of pick away at the different aspects of your business model to understand which pieces you can focus on to make that transition as you're doing that over a course of the book of business that could be millions of customers or millions of policyholders at one time. So it's like transformers where they transform one <laughs> yes. a piece at a time, you know, the arms are coming up and then the other part comes up. And just to go on what you said, Mike, and what Ted said, I think it is the smaller companies, the start startups, it's easy for them to just like move fast, fall, fail, and get back up. But I think it's really difficult for the large incumbents to do that. I'm A lot of people say it's almost impossible, but sometimes that's why it's easier for them to acquire a startup and just have that flexibility there. It's just so difficult. Sure when you're so big. Yeah. No, it's so true. It's so true. I mean, I, I will tell you working at a startup, I can say that the word impossible is never used. Anything is possible <laughs> right. if you put enough time and resource into it. So I, I have enough feathers in my cap here now of jobs that I never in my life anticipated doing insurance that you get to work on on a startup, which is amazing. But it's like going for your MBA. You get to, you get to interact with things and people and different things. But the, the issue I think at hand with incumbent carriers, again, is just, is just the sheer size. And the compartmentalization that they have within those companies. I mean, I can speak to just all state and nationwide, having worked for both of those. But even at Enterprise Rent a Car when I was there, you have a, a large regionalization of these companies that have been operating for so long in the US that they've become somewhat compartmentalized around the country with regional offices and regional leadership teams. And there's a lot more levels and layers that you have to pick away at for approval. You know, one region may really want to integrate this new technology and this new underwriting process, but another one may not because the person who's running that region used to be in underwriting and doesn't want to impact the jobs of all the people that they hired and all these different things. So there's there's so many different layers around how this is. But at the end of the day, it's really around, it, it should really all be about the customer. I mean, everything that I think you'll see in the insure tech space and what companies like Hippo are doing is really trying to bring the focus back around what is best for the consumer, not what's best for the company. I mean, we can use technology, we can use all these different things, and we can enhance the customer experience. And that's ultimately what we feel the customer is really looking for at this point. They want a decent policy, gives them the coverages that they want for the things that they want, and they want to be able to do it fast and easy where it's not taking time away from their life. And and that's the piece that I think the incumbents are really going to have somewhat of a struggle with just because you have so many different layers that they have to get through before they can get to that speed and that quick service. And Arlene, I think you're absolutely right when you say about them purchasing a company the same way all state bought insurance as they saw an end to be able to do it. I don't any different where progressive, you know, got into the homeowner space because they realized that they have a lot of consumers who own cars and want to start buying homes. And these different companies are realizing that they have to start to move, but it's you know, what do you bet on? Where do you bet on it? When do you pull the trigger to actually do some of these things? Yeah, but the first question they're asking and the incumbents are also asking themselves now something they didn't before. Rather than looking at ourselves and coming up with solutions for customers, we need to listen to the customer, hear what they have to say and see if we can build that for them. Because the customer at the center is what we keep hearing over and over again. I think uh, on, up until recently, that wasn't the case. It was the other way. The customer was not at the center. We were just creating ideas and then putting it out to market. And I think everybody is now looking at the same bullseye and they're saying that bullseye is the customer. Yep, exactly. So let's go to today. Now you have um, joined Hippo, a startup, and I think you've been there for about a year or so. And it's a totally innovative, uh, fresh and complete change. And uh, this startup was founded by a soft wand who I would say is a serial entrepreneur. Um, tell us a little bit about Hippo. Sure, absolutely. I'm I'm always happy to talk about <laughs> Hippo. So I joined uh, I joined Hippo officially in January of 2017. Uh, I had started talking with a soft, believe it or not, through LinkedIn uh, okay. a little bit toward the end of 2016, and we connected and got to talk in. I met with him for about 10 minutes and heard his vision. And as you said, I mean, a soft is a serial entrepreneur, but he cares about the customer. And, and that was one of the things that really resonated with me of, you know, what him and the rest of the team here at Hippo were really trying to do is understand, again, the customer need. What is the issue at hand with the homeowner's market and how people get their insurance? And what are the, what are the kind of 
really hard points that the customer has with their insurance contract and their insurance agent and those types of things. And, you know, I came out, spent a day with him and made the decision to join Hippo, which obviously joining, going from a company the size of Enterprise Rent-A-Car to a company the size of Nationwide to the size of Allstate to joining a, a pre-Series A startup in Silicon Valley in the most expensive place on the planet is, uh, was, quite a, was, was quite a jump and a leap. Uh, but I was that passionate about the conversation and about what we were going to do here at Hippo. And, and our focus has primarily been on enhancing that customer experience. How, how do we make it easier for the customer? How do we build a contract and a policy that is actually going to provide things for the customer that they actually need? How do you remove or decrease coverages for things like crypts and mausoleums and stock certificates and coins and gold bullion and all these things that were put into ISO forms back in the 60s and 70s and give you know, better things for things like equipment breakdown and service line protection and increased computer and equipment coverage in your house or home office equipment for the one in five people that work from home and those types of things. And, and that focus was really kind of the piece that I latched on to really understanding that, wow, I can actually use technology to create a better underwriting experience for the customer, not mm-hmm. for the company. You know, you can use the technology to create an onboarding experience and an underwriting experience that's streamlined for the customer where you're probably getting a better underwriting result at the end of the day because you're using better technology and better information, but you're also providing what the customer actually needs, which just creates a whole different interaction point with that customer experience as you're bringing them on board. And in the tech space, you know, you constantly hear all this stuff in insure tech. It's disruption, disruption, disruption. That's not our play. You know, we're not about, Hippo is not about disrupting anything. We're enhancing the insurance experience. That's what we're doing. The disruption that you see in insure tech right now is, I, I, it's interesting because a lot of these companies that are getting into this space forget that insure tech is made up of two words. It's insurance and it's technology. Mm-hmm. The worst thing you can possibly do is go to a regulator and talk about, I'm disrupting insurance. That's the last thing they want to hear you say. <laughs> you know, the disruption is, the disruption's in the technology. But we're taking the insurance contract. It's still, it's being modernized. It's not, no one's changing the insurance contract for a homeowner's policy. I mean, the base of what you're covering is still the same. It's still a house. It still has mainly the same things in it. It did years ago, the construction types and those things. So you're really just enhancing that. The disruption is coming on the technology. The technology piece is the space that is allowing the insurance experience to change with automated underwriting and IoT and aerial imagery and automation that you can actually build in that streamlines that process and eliminates a lot of things. And that's the focus that we're really, really concentrating on at Hippo is enhancing that customer experience. You know, over the course of the 10 or so years that the average customer is with their homeowner's carrier, you know, I don't want one touch point. I'd love to have 10 touch points. I don't want to just talk to you when you buy a policy from me and then when you have a claim. I want to make sure that I'm being proactive with you while I have your policy for 10 years and prevent that claim from ever even happening at the end of the day. Going back to disruption, do we consider ever a software upgrade from 2.0 to 3.0 a disruption? I mean, because to me, that's what I see in the industry. As you were saying, insurance and technology, and all you're really doing is adding better technology to what is already existing there. So like you said, it's not a disruptor, and you don't want to go to any of these guys in the industry to mention that kind of thing and say, hey, we're disrupting the industry. No. What you're doing is you've just added an enhancement. You just went from 2.0 to 3.0 or 11.0 to 12.0. And to me, that again, that's not disruption. This is something exactly. that is, it, it's continual change, continual growth, and you've got to keep up. And every company has known this, that if you do not keep up with the shifts in time, what's going on with the needs of your customers, you're going to lose out at the end. You're not going to exist. So I, I was just going to say that, that one, of the, one of the important things that, that incumbents are going to have to do is they have to get out of the legacy system world. And that's, that's a very problematic thing to do when you have 10 million customers on one platform and you need to migrate them over to another. You know, the in, most interesting part of when I met with Asaf the first time was him sitting me down in a room and saying, we're going to build our own in-house policy management system from scratch. And I looked at him and laughed literally in his face. It's like, that's not possible. He's like, yes, it is possible. It's just nobody wants to actually take the time to do it. And we did. You know, I, I locked in a room with our CTO and a couple of our tech guys for about a four month period. And we built a policy management system from scratch that's built to live and breathe and grow with the company. 
so that I can integrate and be cloud-based through Amazon or all these other cloud-based technologies. So 10 years from now, I can actually grow with my customers. So when a new technological tool comes out to help me underwrite, I can integrate that tool into my system. I don't need to build a new system. I built one that is willing to grow. I think of it as a power strip. You know, and most systems are built with eight plugs. And once you fill those eight plugs, your system is obsolete. Ours is unlimited. We built it with an unlimited power strip. So I can plug as many data sources as I need into this system over the course of the next 20 years if I want to. So I can grow my product with my customer and make sure that I'm offering them the best benefit that I possibly can. Well, at the same time, I'm providing the underwriters the proper tools that they need to be able to underwrite the risks in a streamlined way and provide a better service to that customer at the end of the day. And the incumbents have these huge antiquated systems. And that's the piece that's really difficult because they don't want to dis... When they hear disrupt, they think disruption to their customer base. And they don't want to lose. They want retention. They want to keep those customers. And disrupting that by migrations and all these different things, when you have a billing system that doesn't talk to your underwriting system, that doesn't talk to your policy system, it just creates this friction point that they just don't want to fully dive into it. And that's the piece that's going to be the struggle, because if you can't migrate over these policies, how are you ever going to be able to integrate with some of these amazing technologies that are real time? I get real time aerial imagery on my policies in the quote flow at the time of purchase, as soon as I get the address. You know, that data is great to have at that point. It may not be worth the money to get it after I've already written the policy when a, you know, a hurricane is approaching Texas. You know, it's, these are the types of things that down the road as catastrophes continue to grow and all these other issues that we see in home insurance especially, it, it's going to continue to morph. And that's going to be one of the really big struggles that there's going to be for some of the bigger carriers to kind of get into this space. Spot On is sponsored by Insurance Licensing Services of America. Need help with corporate name changes, annual returns or surplus lines tax filings? Feeling overwhelmed? If you're looking for experts in regulatory compliance, you've come to the right place. ILSA provides the industry with over 50 services. To learn more about the company and how they can help, visit ilsainc.com. Mike, one of the things is uh, our listeners are just all across, well, actually all across the world now. We have listeners from from all over, but all levels. We have um, licensing specialists, compliance specialists. We have people that just are surplus lines, um, uh, tax processors. And we get a lot of emails and messages on LinkedIn on people that are just looking to even explore other areas in the industry. And so I would like for you to take us back a little bit and just give us an overview about what an underwriter does. What did they typically do in the past? Let's go old school. Like what was an underwriter's typical job? Sure. Well, I always tell people the story when I started at Nationwide, the first gift that I received was my prorate wheel that I used to hand calculate the 30-day underwriting period or the 45-day underwriting period and spin the little wheel on my desk to understand the days uh, back back in the 2000s. So it's definitely come quite a long way since uh, since then. So, you know, underwriting is is an awesome space. The reason I joined underwriting is because it touches every every facet of insurance is touched by underwriting. It doesn't matter whether it's billing, policy management, whether it's selling the policy, acquiring a policy, claims, everything at some point will touch the underwriting process because it'll always come back to you know, how did we look at this policy? How did we underwrite this policy? And it doesn't matter if that's auto, if it's life, if it's health. If it's home insurance, it really doesn't matter. Underwriting is kind of the junk drawer of insurance and the opportunities to work with a multitude of different departments. And that's been one of the unique things in my career has always been able to work with the sales team, work with the product organization, work with the regional leadership teams, work with the claims team. Underwriting is an amazing place to really understand and learn all the different business aspects of insurance. And it was by chance that I ended up in underwriting. But at the end of the day, it was really the best thing possible for my career because I was able to understand all the different pieces that were going and how they all came together. You know, if Mm -hmm. I had started in product, I really would have just understood product. You don't really deal like I would have had a great knowledge of the product. I started in claims for about six months and I really knew total loss very well, but I didn't really understand much about how the policies were sold or anything like that. So you can go back through as an underwriter and you actually get to learn all these different things. You know, I went back when I started at Hippo, it's off. It's like, why aren't you a licensed agent? I said, I'm an underwriter. I don't really talk to the customer that much. And he's like, 
well, you need to be licensed because you need to be on the phone with our customers. If they have questions, I want them to talk. Why would the person who knows most about all the different products in the insurance and the underwriting space not be the one on the phone with the customer? So I went and got a PNC license so that I could interact with our customers and actually get feedback about the underwriting process. It's a it's a different methodology. So I've concentrated in my career mainly in the underwriting space because I still get to work in all the different departments of insurance. And it's still, it's fun to work in compliance and understand what the department of insurance is, is kind of looking for. So it's a great stepping stone. But the, the difficulty that a lot of people have when they think about joining the, the underwriting team is you have to start at the bottom. You can't join mm-hmm. an underwriting group and expect to come in with no underwriting experience at the top. And I think that scares a lot of people away from, you know, kind of getting into this piece of, of what we do, but it's really the best learning place to actually have an opportunity because once you've been in underwriting for a number of years, you can take your insurance career path. In my opinion, obviously, this is me talking about where I've been, but you can really take your, your career path in insurance anywhere you want to go from an underwriting department because you have a basic knowledge of all the different aspects of what, of what we do on a daily basis. That's fantastic information. We talked a little bit about what the process was like before with the, with the wheel, the, the rating wheel. You are now with Hippo, and of course, you guys have had a lot of press coverage you guys are doing things like delivering quotes in 60 seconds, issuing a policy and a little bit over that. And it's it's technology. Technology is allowing you to do that today. And I want for you to share with the young people out there or people that are looking to get into underwriting, which used to be considered like a mundane and uh, boring type of job, very methodical why has it gone to become one of the most coveted and innovative jobs out there? How do you guys do it? I, I'm going to stick mainly with Hippo on this one, obviously, because this is where the where I, I've had the best opportunity to really employ and implement all of the various tools that there are out there. And, and I, I always break it up into three different sections. The first one is the acquisition of a customer. How do you get somebody to come to you and come through the door? And, I, and I'm speaking of this from an underwriting perspective, not a marketing perspective or anything like that, but how I think of this as an underwriter from an underwriting perspective. When somebody comes in the door, what do we want them to do? So in the homeowner space, if you think about a property that somebody owns or somebody is buying, you, know, you ask a million questions on the underwriting application for a homeowner's insurance policy. What's your roof type? You know, what's your siding material? How much percentage of the house is hardwood floor versus carpet versus this? I bought a house in Atlanta in 2006, and I can tell you I went there two times before I bought that house. My wife mm-hmm. is the one at the time who bought our insurance policy, and she didn't have a damn clue what the hell the roof type was on the house <laughs> or anything else. You know, and if, and if she's thinking about if she's thinking, well, when was the roof last replaced? Well, I don't know. The house was built in 2006, but Atlanta's a hail prone area. Was it just replaced? Who the hell knows? So you can't expect right. the customer to answer questions that they really don't know. But at the same time, as an underwriter, I'm thinking of it as we're forcing people to make decisions about the property that they don't know accurate answers to. And which is part of the reason why 40% of the U.S. is underinsured on their houses half the time, because they don't know the aspects that are there. And the insurance companies asking them questions they don't know. So what we tried to do here at Hippo is take as many data sources as I can in real time, pull all those data sources in and aggregate that data so that I know that, yes, this one source in California that I get roof material source from may be extremely accurate, but in Texas, it may not be that accurate. So I need the ability to have multiple data sources that provide the exact same element of data, but each have a different accuracy level that I can take and aggregate that data to understand which one is going to be most accurate for that customer. So I can fill in those questions and say, here's what we know about your house. I'll let you still confirm what you need to confirm because it's not always right. Data is not always right. You know, big data has gotten cleaner and has gotten a lot more accurate. But at the end of the day, I still want the customer to confirm everything. And I want to know more about the person and about the risk and their appetite. So as they're coming through this onboarding flow, you know, we set an underwriting box. I know what our appetite is. I don't want to send somebody through an underwriting process that's going to take 45 minutes of their time. They get to the last screen and be like, yeah, that's a great price. I want to purchase. And it's all right, no problem. Let me do this last check. Oh, I'm really sorry. You know what? Your house is actually in a brush zone. I can't write it. We tried to streamline the underwriting process and the onboarding to make sure that the customer gets their decision as fast as possible. If we can't write your policy, we want to tell you we can't write your policy. It's not about us trying to stream you along and sell you 10 different products. We're trying to sell you a homeowner's process 
for or a homeowner's policy for something that is going to be one of the biggest investments you're ever going to make in your life. I want it to be quick, easy, and seamless. So that's the onboarding. So we can put them through that flow very, very, very quickly. Then the underwriting process after they are actually through that flow and purchase a policy, we continue to do the underwriting process to understand the risk. Are there any additional fraud indicators that we need to be concerned about? We're in a direct-to-consumer space, so obviously there's always that risk. A little bit less on the homeowner side than you're going to see in auto and some other in- insurance products and things like renters and stuff. But it's it's really now understanding the person and the policy and what they have and what are the fraud indicators. And can I use aerial imagery to determine whether or not I need to inspect this home? Are they in a brush zone? Can I determine all these different factors and create a risk calculation of catastrophe exposure You know, for earthquakes or tornadoes or hail or wind or hurricane and all these different things, but then also assess the risk so I can tell the customer of, you need to be concerned about flood. You may want to look into a flood policy. You need to be concerned about earthquake, all these different things. So I can understand what do I need to assess on this? And then I can automate my inspection process to say 90% of the time, I don't need to inspect a home. And some houses have hazards and I've spent my entire career canceling policies because of wood rot or moss growth on the roof and all these things. And then at the end of the day, it's like, this guy's never had a claim in 10 years. Why the hell is he going to file one now? Why would I cancel this risk that I've now just paid an acquisition cost for if I don't need to? So it's how do you build your algorithms to understand those risks and make the best decisions through a computer without a human even having to, to kind of take a look at it? And the last one is really setting up a proactive underwriting relationship with that customer once they're your customer. It's not, I sell you a policy today, you have a claim in nine years, and then I call you when you have a claim. How do I protect your house? How do I protect your investment? I always use the analogy of an auto, of the auto industry with cars. You know, you had airbags. Then all of a sudden you had a reverse camera. Now you have all these sensors and cars that are really now protecting the car, not just the driver, but they're actually protecting the vehicle. Home is going in that same space with IoT technologies and all these various insure tech startups in this space of how do I protect your house? I would much rather have a claim experience if you never had a claim than providing you this amazing claims experience when you have a loss. I think the customer would probably choose to just not have the loss in the first place. So it's really now we create this proactive, helpful underwriting process where it's ongoing. Can I get continual aerial imagery updates? So if you add a pool and forget to call and tell your insurance company about it, I get a flag and find out about it and can reach out to you and say, hey, we see you put a pool in your yard. You need to up your other structures coverage. We need to up your liability insurance because if somebody has an accident at your property now, it's a higher risk to you. I want to actually protect your risk. But at the same time, you're putting that thought into a customer's mind of they want to protect their risk too. And they want to make sure that they keep that at the forefront. So it's it's really kind of a three-part experience that we provide to the customer from the minute that they come to our webpage all the way through the life cycle of that policy that they're a hippo customer. Yeah, I mean, how how far we've come now, instead of looking at their loss history, which many times is not even uh, significant, right? Because if they haven't had losses, but um, it, perhaps they just didn't file a claim, but you can now pull satellite imagery. You can use drones to assess what that roof looks like um, and get a really good feel for what you're insuring. We've come such a long way. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that as an insurance, as the industry has kind of progressed, especially in the homeowner space, is we always look at claims like, well, the person filed a claim. We need to, well, we need to make sure we cancel their policy or up their rate. Well, what is, has anybody ever sat back and thought about, well, what did they file the claim for? Did somebody actually sit down and make sure that they understood their insurance policy? You know, maybe that customer actually viewed their insurance policy as a maintenance policy. Maybe we should actually have a warranty endorsement in their policy that covers things that they actually need. You know, one of the really unique things that Asaf Wan and Aviad Pinkovesky, our head of product, did when, when um, they first really kind of came up with the concept of HIPPO and home insurance was spending a great deal of time understanding what is the problem that people have with home insurance. And it wasn't that they didn't have an okay insurance policy or they didn't have coverage. It was the fact that the, you know the insurance regulators are going to make insurance companies pay a claim when they're required to pay a claim. The problem was is people didn't realize that they didn't have coverage for the things that they thought they had coverage for. And, and that mm-hmm. was really the misconception that people had around home insurance was, well, my insurance company is just going to deny it. And it's true. I mean, people have pools. You have pool pumps. Now you have solar panels. 
you have all these new electronical equipment. You have a smart fridge that you paid $3,000 for or a smart washer and dryer that you can control from your cell phone. These newer things in homes that people just don't realize weren't covered under their contract. So they spent a great deal of time understanding what are the things that people are really pissed off about. The tree fell over in the front yard and up uprooted the sewer line and they realized, well, that's between the house and the street. I'm sorry, there's no coverage for that. And it's not that the insurance company was wrong in saying it's not, we're not paying this. It's not covered by your contract. It's the customer doesn't understand what they're actually getting. So they anticipate us as the, you know, as the company to say, look, here's the coverages that you actually need. You live in this area. You are very highly prone in Texas to a higher water table. You probably want to increase your water backup coverage. I'm going to quote your policy with these coverages. I'm not going to show you a price just to make you buy an inefficient product. I want to include equipment breakdown and service line protection and water backup coverage as a standard in my contract. So I know that you're at least going to have this coverage. And then it's you making the decision to remove it, not us making the decision to never have offered it to you in the first place. Cool. I want to shift gears a little bit because I want to get into getting regulatory approval in the 51 jurisdictions. We know that that doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us how long the approval process took for you guys when you were uh, getting into this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The insurance industry as a whole with the regulation that goes on, I mean, to your point, it's literally we're 51 different countries in essence. And, And in the tech space, I talk to some European companies on a fairly regular basis. And it's a different insurance market there. And some of them that are trying to get into our market don't understand how the regulation works. You know, the NAIC is, they're a great group. They're, they're really consumer advocates and trying to protect the consumer and make sure that insurance companies are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And we've met with them and talked with them about what we're trying to do. And I think one of the things that we've always tried to make sure that they understand of what Hippo is doing, again, is around the proactive nature. We're trying to make this process better. One of our first hires at Hippo was a head of compliance, which was shocking to me when Asaf said, we're hiring a head of compliance now. Usually you hire a head of compliance when you need to come in and clean up after, after a big mess happens, not beforehand, because the compliance piece is the most important part about working with the regulators and getting a product approved and what you're doing. So for us, I mean, that process has really been about keeping a very active nature with the departments, you know, working with very reputable firms around actuarial sciences and our forms and documentation and and making sure that it's open and it's a back and forth conversation about exactly what we're doing, how we're doing it and what coverages we're offering. It's, It's the same process for us as it would be for any other company. Make a filing in Texas. We have to wait, you know, 60 days for them to get a response. They'll send us objections. We'll send back responses similar to what you would see in, in any other company that, you know, I've worked with in the past of doing these regulatory filings. But at the same time, I do feel like the insurance commissioners, especially through the NAIC, are really starting to take note and understanding about how tech is getting into this space. I mean, they can't stop what's going on in in the space around the technologies that are being used. So I think they're really starting to embrace kind of what we're doing and how we're doing it, but are keeping a very close eye on exactly how this is all kind of going down. You see all these different insurance conferences. When I was at InsureTech Connect last year in Las Vegas, there were 3,000 people. This year, they're expecting 6,000 people. Same thing with the insurance analytics and AI conference in Chicago. They're starting to show up at these events and understand truly what's going on. The NAIC event in Kansas, I think it was in Kansas City a few weeks back. The conversation is kind of shifting around this. And the regulatory approval process at some point, I think, is going to get enhanced a little bit too. I mean, you're going to start to see more automation and an easier way to interact with the regulators and the filings and things as technology helps. I will think help them understand contracts the same way you're seeing technologies and law uh, around contract readers and different things to find the differences will speed up hopefully that approval process as we continue to expand out in sure tech in, in this space. Uh, in our conversation, yeah, hopefully is, is the right word. We've had plenty of conversations with people around the country on this, uh, regulators, and it, it is a chore for them. They're way behind and they are uh, continually looking at, at how they might be able to speed up the process. But mostly they're afraid to be that first one to take that first step, um, sure. to be that first state and that kind of thing. So they're almost waiting for somebody else to fall before they take action. And it's unfortunate because the way technology is moving all around them, this is the bottleneck. Right. They're, yep. they're becoming bottlenecks and they've got to figure out a way to make this process faster and, and, and still help everyone. Everybody knows that the laws are way behind in terms of the way technology is moving, the way things are moving now in the internet. 
the laws just are having a hard time keeping up. And it's the same thing with the regulators. But the great thing yep. is that the conversation is being held. Mike, I think you and I spoke when Ted and I were out at the NAIC Insurance Summit. And of course, that's a, a, a conference wherein you have regulators from across the 51 jurisdictions. And actually, we actually had many regulators from uh, the Virgin Isles as well. We had Puerto Rico uh, in the house as well. But um, the conversations are taking place on how do we streamline uh, the compliance process? How do we get ahead, or not so much ahead, but try to keep up with what's going on um, the, in short tech space? Because you're trying to design coverages where it's on demand, and then you have all of these roadblocks with compliance, and uh, they're working on it. They definitely are working on it. Like Ted said, it's just that not one particular state is looking to be the trailblazer on it, but I think it's going to be more of a group together. Hey, this is the proposed uh, act that we're going to put out there. And you see those conversations in all the reg tech conferences that you're starting to see now. But some of the insure tech people that we've spoken to here have said that there are certain states that are managing to do things a lot. The regulatory approvals are coming in a lot faster. There are states that are lagging behind. And those states, I think, uh, is necessary for a lot of people to talk to them and say, this has got to change. We've got to figure out a way and get them focused on it. And I, I think we've been in some meetings in New York where that's the conversation. The conversation is how do we speed up this process? How do we make this happen? How do we get that new technology in to help us? Well, yeah, especially if it's going to be a benefit to the consumer. I mean, anytime you're adding new companies, whether it's an MGA or an incumbent carrier with a new product idea or something else, If at the end of the day, it's ultimately a new option for the consumer, I I mean, that's really what the Department of Insurance is 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 there for. I mean, it's but at the same time, insurtechs and this is defense of the regulators. Insurtechs are moving at the speed of light, and there's a lot of new ideas and a lot of crazy things that have been thrown out out there. And we see blog articles and new posts from all kinds of different insurtech companies about crazy ideas that they have and things that. They truly do scare the regulators. And there is going, that's going to be another piece of this process that's going to slow down because it's not just about regulatory filings. It's also about what people are putting out there, what product ideas and what things they're saying, because there are some consumer protections out there that are really important to keep around protecting the rights of the customer and especially around an insurance contract. I mean, if a house burns down, it's a massive event. I mean, obviously California is a great example last year with the, with the wildfires. I mean, you had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of consumers who lost everything they own. And it's really the point where an insurance company can either shine or kind of fall off the edge if they're not really providing what they need to provide. And I think that's the piece of how do you speed up that process, but for them still make sure that they are meeting the the regulations and, and everything else that they need to do. And it is, it's just, it's a slow moving process that has just got to get faster over time. Yeah, but the regulators, I think what's at the forefront is protecting the consumer. And yep. you're right. That's where their he- that's where their hesitancy comes in because they don't want to make that mistake where they're not protecting that consumer as a result of this new technology or whatever it is coming in. But uh, there yep. has to be a way to speed it up. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit. We talked about how the underwriting process has become more streamlined. It's definitely more efficient. We could see that with the way HIPPO, like I said, is issuing policies in a matter of seconds. So with the underwriting process becoming more efficient, does that allow a company like HIPPO to dedicate more resources on the distribution and customer experience? Yeah, it goes back to what I had said earlier about the underwriting experience and the onboarding where I was talking about it from an underwriter of that acquisition, customer acquisition and bringing customers in the door. But at the same time, it's really about the acquisition of the customer from a marketing end and and from the company aspect. It's not, I don't want to say that it's not kind of reorganizing resources and things like that, but it, it allows us to have a better interaction point with our customer. So I have friends obviously all over the country that have worked in the underwriting space for a long time. And I talk about a lot of the things that we're working on. And I always get the constant pushback of, man, you're eliminating our jobs. And it's, no, you're really specializing your job because insurance has become this place where you have a lot of people. And I would say this back to the point from earlier about, you know, what would I tell somebody joining this industry 
is you need to be specialized in something. There's a lot of positions in insurance that are just widget movers. I hate to say it that way, but that's you have people who are there just to collect a paycheck. They're going to come in from nine to five. They're going to get through their hundred tickets that day and they're going to go home. What technology is going to do in this space, and this is one of the things that we're doing at Hippo, is it's eliminating the need for all of the widget moving. It's automating the stuff that can be automated. So you have a specialized person who can focus on what that customer actually needs. The underwriting team at Hippo are all support agents. We all work together. They sit with the sales team. We constantly interact with one another. I can have any person on my team talk to a customer. 95% of the group is PNC licensed. They're the ones who actually will reach out and talk about things to a customer. It's that interaction point. So you can shift resources to enhance the customer experience, enhance the acquisition, streamline the process, And everybody has a voice to be able to provide feedback of what they think might be a better interaction point. When we started, I talked to probably our first two, three, four hundred customers between myself and a couple other people on the team to just understand how did you interact with our web page? What did you like? What did you not like? How did you think of the contract? Did somebody go through all these coverages? Can I spend 20 minutes going through everything that you actually have on where you live and different things to understand? And it's a constant evolution. We're making these changes. So the resource piece is really just, an it's a living, breathing thing. You can't just make it for today and expect it to work going forward. You're going into, for us as a startup, you know, we're live in 10 states right now. You know, we're going to be, we have 40 states left to get into. Every one of those markets are different. The way someone reacts and interacts with the hip, myhippo.com in California is not going to be the same way somebody in Indiana does it. And it's certainly not going to be the same way somebody in Florida does it. So your distribution channel and all these different aspects, it's a, just, it's a constant work in progress to make sure you're refining the experience. But always at the end of the day, it's really all around what the customer is doing with what we're providing them, You know, the service that we're giving and, and how our you know, claims process is going through when there is a loss. And all these different things is, is really the kind of step-by-step and how we've moved these pieces and put them all together. And going back, uh, you touched upon a, a loss. I think I read in a Forbes article recently that not only are you guys issuing policies in record time, but you're going uh, two steps back into the whole process and you're actually doing things to prevent claims. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. A- absolutely. Happy to. We have you know, we have a very comprehensive long-term strategy of working with our customers to prevent loss. We have a huge IoT process that we do around understanding how can we integrate with your home. You know, I mentioned earlier my analogy to auto. I'm super, super focused. One of my biggest projects and one of my biggest passions in insurance right now is the IoT space. I love IoT. Um, I I test every kind of IoT product. My house has sensors all over it. I I just I feel like this is really what's going to revolutionize home insurance over the next 10 or 20 years because there's two things that are going to change in, in my opinion and is auto is going to go down because you're going to have mm-hmm. automated cars that are going to drive themselves. So the auto industry is going to, you know, the insurance space there is going to change drastically over the next 10 years. And the catastrophe and exposure risk in the U.S. is going to skyrocket. And it's really around positioning yourself long term of understanding your exposure and how do you prevent loss. Can I take two people who are neighbors who have an almost identical profile? Let's say their credit's exactly the same. Their house is roughly the same size. They have the same history. They're the same age. All those parameters are the same. Can I look at their actual risk? Is one person's you know, washer and dryer on the second floor? The other person's is on the first floor. If there's a loss in the one house versus the other, what's my water loss risk there? One person may be closer to brush or the other one isn't. You know, all these different things that we've looked at from rating factors and understanding the risk, but you're never going to be able to truly charge enough rate to offset everything. So it's really the mitigation at this point. Can I tell somebody if I say, look, you're going to get a package with three sensors in it because we want to help protect your house. Here are the Mm -hmm. three locations in your house that are most likely to have a loss in the next 10 years. This is what you need to do. Can I be proactive at your renewal and rerun our aerial imagery and realize that you have debris built up on your roof? Is it proactive and better for me as Hippo to say, we're going to send a gutter cleaner out to your house once a year, and they're going to clean out your gutters so that you don't get any water damming. In the winter, if you're in New York or if you're in California, we're going to send out a gardener that's going to trim back all this brush. How do you create these interactive, proactive, long-term relationships to continue to mitigate the loss and not just inspect it once at new business and then inspect it again five years down the road? It's a constant evolution of protecting the property and mitigating that claims loss because customer doesn't understand. You think about IoT, 
and discounts people get. If you look at all the different loss perils that are out there, fire and water are your two big non-cat losses that people are going to experience. The customer doesn't think about that. They think about theft. I want to protect my house. I want to put in cameras. I want to put an alarm system because somebody's going to break in when I'm home alone or my wife. It's an absolute risk, but it happens 1.2% of the claims versus 30% of the water losses. I can replace most things that get stolen, but when water damages your kid's paintings that they made for you when they were in kindergarten, you can't replace that stuff. So the experience that you have of preventing that loss from happening or preventing it from being a catastrophic loss and making it a $2,000 loss, it's a benefit for the company from an insurance perspective, but it's more of a benefit for that consumer because you've just created a much better experience for them. Uh, in, in the whole process of having to deal with insurance and deal with claims and all these different things. Well, IoT is constant monitoring. When you talk about water leaks, when IoT is able to measure the pressure inside these pipes, and then you have it, but like you said, not monitoring every five years, but it's it's constantly monitoring that for you and can warn you, hey, this is getting to a critical point, which uh, I didn't read much about what went on in New York recently with that explosion. But the first thing I thought was, wow, they could have certainly used IoT at this point because it would have told them, hey, this pressure is backing up. Of course. I mean, that's that's exactly that's exactly right, Ted. I mean, it's, it's really what you're trying to do. Customers want to interact now. They don't want to have to think about it, but they want to know that their cell phone's going to buzz to let them know when they're packaged from Amazon's at the front door. I'm pretty certain that most customers would want to know, hey, your alarm is going off in your house. Here's a push notification from Hippo telling you that you forgot to shut your garage door and it's now 11 o'clock at night. You might want to yes. check and make sure that you shut it. It's, it's, and it's also, though, to the flip side of that coin, though, is where does it get too big brotherish? How do you integrate this stuff and make it in a way where it's consumer friendly? If it's a pain in the rear for them to plug it in or figure it out or somebody can't understand how to hook it up, it's going to sit in a box underneath in a closet somewhere and it's never going to get used, which does no good for me and does no good for them. So it's also, you also have to integrate with the right technologies. Who's going to be around in 10 years? You have There's thousands of these IoT tech startups right now in these spaces, and some of them have some crazy cool products. But at the same time, it's, well, yeah, but what's your distribution strategy? If I have 100,000 customers next year, are you going to be able to provide these products? What if you're gone in three years? Will this still integrate with maybe Amazon mm. or one of these other companies? So you, there's, there's a lot of different pieces that you have to think about with IoT strategy and who you partner with, how you partner with them, how long you partner with them, and the interaction point that you're going to have with the customer. Is it a system that's built into the house versus a system they can unplug and take with them? California is a great example. I mean, they passed laws that make it so a new home has to have sprinkler systems in it. They just passed a bill that says you're going to have to have solar panels on new homes that are built. Can you work with home builders that are out in the market like Lennar and Toll Brothers and some of these other companies that are out there that are building houses like crazy in the U.S. to integrate at the forefront, in the beginning, you know, you have groups in insurance like IBHS Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety that have their fortification program around fortified homes. At some point, all houses are going to have to be fortified in coastal areas and some other areas as catastrophes continue to get worse. It's the direction that home insurance is going in, but it's, you know, who's going to get there first and who's going to have the best ability to kind of take advantage of some of these technologies that are out there as, as the exposures continue to change. Going back to one of the things you were saying, it makes you feel good when you have something like an August lock where we would be, you know, five miles down the road. Oh, my God, I think we left the door open. That concern that you have to use August lock as an example, we walk out and five minutes later, the door closes behind you. And it sends you that, that thing on your iPhone that says, hey, you're on a way mode. The door just closed for you. And it does give you a sense of relief and comfort. Absolutely so, does. Um before we wrap up, one uh, thing that I would love for you to share is you mentioned crazy cool. So I want to find out what's what's crazy cool out there that you see in the horizon that's going to enhance the underwriting process even further. That you could talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I... I I, you know, I really hit on most of it. I, IoT is honestly the one and the the one thing that I think from an uh, an underwriting standpoint that's going to revolutionize insurance. I, I, the discounts that you have, again, back to auto. You know, auto, you have the computer. You know, drive safe and all these different things. You plug your computer in. I can monitor your house. What are the cool things we can do with home insurance ten years from now? If there's fifty sensors in the house, can I create a safe home? discount for this customer of, you know what, in the month of August, you forgot to lock your front door five times, you left your garage door open twice, your alarm, your smoke detector was set off twice. 
can I create a risk factor for somebody and give them a protected home discount that protects them based on how well they take care of their property? Can I be proactive and interactive with them on all these different things? So the IoT and technology space is the one place that is going to have the most expansive impact on home insurance because it's the easiest place for people to integrate. There's not much regulation in that space. People can buy consumer products from anywhere from Amazon to Best Buy to all these different places themselves. There's tons of installed DIY opportunities in this space. So that's probably the one area that is going to have the most impact. The second place, I think, is really with the regulators, Ted, from the conversation you know that we had a few minutes ago about where the regulation is. is it's, a lot of it is going to be dependent on how fast they can move. How quickly can new innovative ideas and product ideas really be be passed in the marketplace with the new insurance products of on-demand insurance that there is out there of turn on, turn off for the small things. You're always going to have your home and auto, but protecting the house, protecting your cars, life insurance, those things, they're always going to be there. The ancillary products, the small side products and things like that are, are going to be interesting around the new technologies that are out there. People want to protect their bikes and their surfboards and their skateboards and all these different little things that insurance products haven't been designed for. So there's going to be some really cool, innovative product ideas that are going to come out from these different companies and just the experiences that you have with AI and machine learning and how people interact with an Amazon Alexa and all these cool things that people are going to be able to do is really going to have a, a huge impact over the next 10 or 15 years on insurance. And it's the same thing with the distribution strategies and channels and marketing trends and the commercials that you see. You know, it's not much different than what Geico did to the auto industry 15 years ago when they started to modernize and and do everything direct to consumer with these big budget advertising and things. Now with Facebook and Twitter, there's just so many new avenues. I think it's hard to say exactly where it's going to end up, but it's going to be awfully cool to see where we're at 10 or 15 years from now. I wanted to ask you one other thing. For our circle of professionals, new ones coming into the industry, what kind of advice, recommendation can you give them uh, as they come into the industry? So depending on which space they're getting into, whether it's insure tech or home insurance, whether they're going to work is innovation. You know, Asaf said to me one time, and I've heard him say this in interviews multiple times, is, you know, if you're not innovating, you're going to become obsolete. And, and that is the main point. You have to have an innovative mentality, uh, mentality all the time of how do you make things better than the status quo. It may not be a great idea. It may be a good idea. There may be exceptional ideas, but you have to have that ability to think outside the box. I looked him dead in the face and thought, there's no way in hell we're going to build a policy management system in four months. And we did it. I said, there's no way we're going to launch 10 states in an 18 month period. And we did it. It's, there's, you have to have an innovative mentality and understanding that you have to challenge things. And the tech space is a great opportunity to understand thinking outside the box. And the unique thing at Hippo for me when I came here, when we were building all these products was all these non-insurance people who were thinking about insurance products as a consumer and not as an insurance professional, which changed the way of why don't we do it this way? Well, it's been done like this for 20 years. That's great. I didn't ask you why it's been done that way. In that sense, I want to know why we don't do it like this. Not because you do it like that, but why not do it like this? And you start to think about things. So it's really just always have a strategic thinking and an innovation to do things better and make the process better than what it is today. Always. Even when you think you've mastered it, that means that it's time to start thinking of a new way to make it better. Fantastic. I think that's wonderful advice. And Mike, um, in wrapping up, if someone would want to reach out to you, how would they possibly connect? I'm on LinkedIn. So, you know, they can look up my profile on LinkedIn. I am always happy to speak to insurance professionals. I meet with all kinds of data vendors. You know, we have a very open philosophy here at Hippo of meeting with a multitude of partners to understand kind of the status of what's going on in the industry and who we can partner with, how we can partner with them. We meet with everybody from MBA students that were in our office yesterday talking to our CEO to people that just come in to understand about a new product or IoT idea and things like that. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm happy to always have a conversation with people and connect and kind of grow this expansive network. You guys have been in insurance for a long time and understand that we all know each other. We Mm -hmm. see people. I've run into people at conferences a million. I'm like, I know you from somewhere. And yeah, I know you too, but I don't remember your name. But we've definitely (laughs) crossed paths. It's 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 a small industry that's growing. It's a great it's a great industry and, and I would love to connect with people. So please, yeah, definitely look me up on LinkedIn and I'm happy to connect. 
Wonderful. Mike, thank you so much for having joined us today on Spot On Insurance. We appreciate you having come on and sharing the wonderful knowledge with our listeners today. I absolutely loved your many insights. Thank you. Visit spotoninsurance.com, where you'll discover an ever-growing library of podcasts, videos, articles, and online tools by professionals for professionals to enhance your insurance education. By the way, that's where you'll also find our podcast notes and bonus resources. Please don't forget to click the iTunes link to rate and review and let others know what you think of Spot On Insurance. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next week.